Welcome to the Civil War Center podcast. Learn about the battles, events, and people that shaped the turning point in American history. I'm your host, Andy Lucian. So today we are joined by Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant, born Hiram Ulysses Grant, was born in Ohio. He had humble beginnings and eventually attended West Point. He served in the Mexican-American War with distinction before venturing into business. Grant would make his name during the American Civil War when he captured Forts Henry and Donaldson for the Union. He would win battles such as Shiloh and Vicksburg and would eventually be given command of Union forces. U.S. Grant would famously accept Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. After the war, he would serve two terms in office as President of the United States. The President's 200th birthday is coming up in just a matter of days. President Grant, thank you for joining us today. How are you? I am fine, thank you. Good to hear, good to hear. So uh, we can jump right into it and uh, start off with your childhood. So my first question would be, what was it like to grow up in Bethel and Georgetown, Ohio? I grew up in, in Georgetown, but a few miles away from Bethel and spent a great deal of time in Bethel. I was born in Point Pleasant, right on the banks of the Ohio River. And uh, when I was about 11 months old, my father, Jesse, and mother, Hannah, repaired inland about 10 miles to the new village of Georgetown that had been founded in 1821 uh, by uh, actually by people from uh, Tennessee, Virginia, and Kentucky who wanted to live in a free state rather than a slave state. And they crossed the Ohio River and set up a new village that they named Georgetown. So Georgetown was a, just about a year old uh, when I was brought there at age 11 months, about a year old. And uh, there were only, I'm told, about 20 buildings in the, the town, the village at that time. But it was very pleasant uh, upbringing. Uh, we were on the frontier. If you look at a map of the United States, particularly in 1822, 23, uh, and follow the Mississippi River and take it all the way up to Canada, you've got the eastern portion of the United States, and that is inclusive of Georgetown, Ohio. So we were in uh, essentially a frontier village in 1822. So I grew up uh, on the frontier. My father was a tanner, uh, which was a key occupation because I grew up in a world uh, of wood and iron that's held together by ropes and leather. And father being a tanner uh, had a good living. Father was a very successful man and a good businessman. In fact, one of his, his all of his friends joked him with him about it. Uh, but one of them was known to say, that Jesse Grant would chase a dollar to hell, uh, that he, he was a good businessman. We were, we were not wealthy by any means, but we were more than comfortable. And we had a brick home, well, which is still in Georgetown to this day and may be visited. In fact, I encourage all, indeed urge, all of your listeners and viewers to go visit my boyhood home. Uh, it's a marvel that it has been so well preserved, and I should like very much for you to come calling. Uh, it appears to be a very nice home that Jesse built there. So um, you mentioned your father, Jesse. Um, your father was an abolitionist, I believe. Uh, and how did his abolitionist views impact young Ulysses? Well, father was an abolitionist, and, and uh, my mother, Hannah, was as well. I was never an abolitionist. Uh, I did not care for slavery, didn't like the idea, but I was not an abolitionist, although I grew up in an abolitionist home. Uh, and as I said, I did not care for the institution of slavery. Uh, but in the war, when uh, we fought that war and crisscrossed the South, 
uh, all of us in the federal armies uh, from men who had no opinion at all about slavery to uh, perhaps even uh, supported slavery. They joined the army to fight for the union, not to abolish slavery. All of those men by the end of the war had come to realize having seen slavery firsthand uh, that it was an evil institution and that indeed it had to be done away with. And uh, uh, I was among the group. Uh, I didn't care for it, didn't think it was a, a good idea. And it was that was a curse in our society. But by the end of the war, I had become uh, very much opposed to slavery and felt it needed indeed to be done away with. And I am very pleased that the war did indeed do away with slavery. Yeah, like Lincoln wanted to answer that question once and for all. So. Yes, he wanted the 13th Amendment passed that would, uh, uh, in the Constitution, uh, not just surrenders or treaties. He wanted it in the Constitution that slavery was illegal and had to be done away with. Um, your childhood growing up there with Jesse and Hannah, did you imagine you would be a soldier? I see you in your dress uniform today. Uh, did you imagine you would be here like this someday? No, no, not at all. Uh, I was uh, I was a, a fairly good student. Uh, I spent too much time looking out the window of the Dutch Hill School that was the name of the school that I went to for six years. And it, too, is still intact and open in my hometown of Georgetown, Ohio. You may visit it as well. In fact, it has a piece of my original artwork in the school. Uh, I was uh, 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 labeled uh, not the best student, but a good student and uh, a hard worker. Did I ever think about rising to the lofty heights that I have? No, sir, not at all. Uh, I was good in math and I was uh, very artistic. Uh, of course, I, I must uh, at this point say that it's uncomfortable for me to talk about my own talents and abilities. Uh, but this venue being what it is, I must needs talk in that manner. And so I'll say I was very good in math and I had something of an artistic talent, which I didn't discover so much or develop until I went to the United States Military Academy and thereby hangs another tale. But I was an average child, my school chums and I playing, running around, swimming at White Oak Creek uh, that ran through the town. I loved horses from the earliest age that I could crawl and, and walk about. I would swing on the tails of the big gray animals that were in my father's tan yard uh, that were making deliveries or pickups but I was never hurt by a horse, never kicked. They just look at me and swish the tail or, or nicker and turn away. And as my mother Hannah said to a friend once, who said, Liz, is it my, my friends call me Liz, my family call me Liz or Ulysses. Uh, she said, oh, Liz just seems to understand horses and they just seem to understand him. And uh, so from a toddler, uh, three, two, three years of age. I had an affinity for horses and they have, they never kicked me or hurt me. I would like to, to dig more into West Point and the horses. Uh, real quick before we do that, I do have one more question about your boyhood. So there's a, a great tale of you moving Dr. Buckner's stone. Uh, that's <laughs> estimated <laughs> to weigh somewhere over, over a ton. Um, and you did this as a young boy. Uh, so I how was... did you... How did you manage to do that? And, and what in your childhood made you so determined? Because I, I couldn't do that. I can't even imagine. <laughs> I was about 14 years old. My father had uh, a, a livery business and something of a little construction business. And Doc Buckner was one of our prominent citizens in town. He built a new home, fine new home downtown near the courthouse. And he liked to sit and pass the time of day on his front porch. And he picked out this rock down by White Oak Swamp, oh, about a half a mile out of town and down a very steep slope and a long winding road. 
and uh, no one could seem to get it out. Well, I said, I can do it because I had studied the rock and it's perhaps the beginning of my, my talents as an engineer because I, I took Dave, which was a horse that I bought from a, a local attorney uh, and I named him Dave after the attorney. Uh, he, he didn't care for it, but I, I thought it was an appropriate name. Dave and I went down to the uh, rock by White Oak Swamp and I, I had studied it. And I, what I did was to, at each end of the rock, it's eight feet long and four feet wide and about 10 inches deep. It weighs, uh, it's estimated to weigh about 2,600 pounds. And it was in mud and soft ground near the creek. I dug trenches out on each end of the rock about where my wagon wheels would be. And as I dug, I had the foresight to realize, make the back of the trench deeper than the front. So when I backed the wagon into the trenches, the back of the wagon lowered to just above the rock surface. I got chains then, and it, it, it was quite the mess, but I took chains and I wrapped them around the rock and then tied them up under the bottom of the wagon and secured it. And that took a good deal of digging and mud and pushing rocks under, uh, chains under the rock. Tied them up under the wagon, got back in the wagon and flicked a, a, a whip up in there, not on the animal, flicked the whip up in the air and Dave pulled the wagon, of course, forward. And since it was chained under the rock, secured to the bottom of the wagon, as Dave went forward, the rock lifted up out of the hole and was suspended just under the back of the wagon and clear of the ground. That's how I got it out. Went up the hill, draw, rode up to Dr. Buckner's fine new home. I like to stress that it was a fine home. And he wanted the rock, of course, for his front step. And I turned the wagon around and Dave backed it up and I just untied the chains and it dropped right down in place in front of Dr. Buckner's porch. And it stood there, sat there for many years. Uh, the house was ultimately torn down. A new public building for the town of Georgetown was built and it was moved ultimately to right behind my boyhood home. And it is there to this day. You may go there, you may stand on the rock that Dave and I moved from White Oak Swamp to Dr. Buckner's home and now it rests in re its retirement behind my boyhood home. But that's how I did it. And men who couldn't figure out how to do it were aghast. They were astounded. How did you do that? How did you figure that out? And uh, a lad of 14. And I told him what I just related to you. Backed the wagon down, tied it up, pulled it out, and it, was, it rode under the wagon. And they marveled at what... Uh, the young Grant lad had done. Uh, but when I was asked, when father asked me, how did you do that? He said, I said, Dave and me. <laughs> well, that's an incredible story. Uh, you seem like a very humble man, but I, I have to admit that's a pretty impressive story. So, uh, so I will sing your praise for that. Thank you. I, I was proud of it. I, <laughs> I allowed myself some, some pride in that. As you should. Oh, you mentioned West Point and the horse. I had to slip the rock story in there because that one just amazes me. But um, I know you broke the high jump record with the horse at West Point. Is that your proudest moment at the academy? Uh, that would be the moment at my of my time at the academy that's mo no most noteworthy. Uh, I was not. Uh, I didn't want to go to West Point. I had no desire, the, the a military life held no charms for me. 
But father wanted me to go to the academy for two reasons. First of all, as I stressed earlier, Andy, the, uh, the town of Georgetown in the 1820s and 30s when I was growing up there, uh, from 1823 when my family moved there to 1839 when I left to go to the academy, it was pretty much on the frontier. And the country was already exploding to the West. We had a vast, uh, unpopulated, uh, undiscovered, for the most part, continent, and the westward push was on. Well, father knew that uh, anyone who had an engineering degree would have his future guaranteed. A man who could build the infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, the buildings, uh, that, that man would have a living assured him. So he wanted me to have an engineering degree. He knew I wanted no part of the tannery business. It disgusted me. Uh, it was good, honest work and gave us a good life. But I, I did not care to go into it as a family business. So father was looking for something for me to do that he felt I could prosper engineering. And 1839 the only college in America that gave an engineering degree was the United States Military Academy. Now, while I was there from 1839 to 1843, Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute came into being and began to offer engineering degrees. But while when I began, uh, it was the only school in the country, West Point, uh, that gave an engineering degree. And I would, and father knew that I was good in math. Uh, I didn't want to go to the academy. I didn't think I was prepared enough that my education had been too rudimentary. Uh, but uh, apparently it was. Uh, much to my great surprise and disappointment, I passed my entrance exam. <laughs> Uh, and, and on the first attempt, I, I passed it. And uh, I was there until I graduated, which I doubted I would never do. I, I didn't think I'll ever graduate. And the, the reason that I didn't do any better than I did, I graduated 22nd out of a class of 39. Now, I like to characterize that uh, as having graduated in the top half of the bottom half. <laughs> uh, but don't don't try that yourself because it won't fly with parents. It, it, it didn't work with mine either. But uh, I graduated comfortably in the middle of the class. And I but I can't remember having ever read my lessons more than one time. I was always reading uh, novels, the latest novels. I've read all of the Walter Scott Waverly novels, all of them. I very much enjoyed the Waverly novels. I read Fenimore Cooper. Uh, I read uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. I love novels. And I spent all of the time that I should have been studying reading the novels of the day. Uh, although the, the Waverly novels, Sir Walter Scott's Waverly novels, gave me great insight into the mindset of the aristocratic South, because they patterned their, their society, high society, after the Walter Scott novels. So I had something of an insight into what, how they thought. I also knew most of them. Uh, remember, my four years from 1839 to 1843 touched seven years altogether because my first year in 39 was the last year for fellows who started in 35. So 1839, I had, I covered seven different years of men that were there before myself and after myself. So I knew, personally knew many of the, particularly the upper leadership of the Southern uh, command, the Confederate command during the war. But I, I should have paid more attention to my studies. Uh, and But I, I read voraciously, and I still read voraciously. And for any of your uh, followers who may be enjoying this, uh, I would admonish them, 
read everything you can. Read it all. Read everything that can't outrun you. And it, because whatever you read, it broadens and deepens you, whatever it may be. So read. Read without end. Read. Did I say read? <laughs> read. Uh, I, West Point, when I went there, was ironically not much of a military school. Most of my studies were in the classics. We had some artillery training and we had some cavalry and saber drill, but not much of either. Now you ask about specifically my high jump record that I set with York, the horse. I had become known as the, uh, the best horseman at West Point. And that's in all of those seven classes that my experience spanned. I was recognized as the best horseman in the academy. And uh, on our graduation day, Sergeant Hirschberger, the old riding master, and I, I knew he was going to do this, but we had a large crowd and a lot of military personnel from Europe. There are some Prussian uh, military leadership there, but uh, Sergeant Hirschberger snapped Grant and uh, to the front. And I was on York. Now, York was a big horse about, as I recall, about 17, 18 hands in height. He was a big fellow, massive horse. I loved him. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, jump the bar. Well, the stanchion had been put in the center of the riding academy, the arena, with all of the sawdust, deep sawdust, as they keep there. And uh, two cadets ran out and lifted the stanchion up to the six foot mark. Now that was pretty much an unheard of height to jump. In fact, no one had ever jumped a horse six feet. And uh, it was uh, uh, something more of a suspenseful item because York was such a big horse. You know, could York clear, could he jump that high? And I got at the end of the arena and began riding. I tightened my legs around him. He felt wonderful. I could feel those muscles, that musculature and that big animal. And he knew what we were going to do. We'd been practicing. And as we pounded through that sawdust, that soft, heavy plopping, we got close to it. I tightened my knees around his waist and he knew what to do. He leapt up like a gazelle. That, that huge horse cleared that six foot stanchion with room to spare. Oh, it was a beautiful moment. Those few seconds that I was sailing over that stanchion on York were some of the, the best of my life. We cleared it. One of, and of course, the, all of the uh, military leadership, the, some of them were frankly astonished. And, uh, the cadets ran out. Sergeant Hersberger said, cleared the stanchions. But one of them, uh, one of my friends, and I don't recall whom, uh, when they took the stanchions out of the riding arena, he took his pocket knife and he cut a line at, there at the six foot margin, carved a line and carved Grant over York, Grant on York. So he had Grant above the line and York below. And that's still in the archives at the United States Military Academy. And that record held for 35 years. So uh, I, yes, I was proud of that. Uh, I, but I will reach back a bit academically and, and say that the real purpose I was there was for an education and I could have done more to, to get the education than set records as a horseman, but I was very proud of it. I'm still recognized, I understand, as the greatest horseman that ever attended West Point. That's a, another incredible story there. Whatever uh, came of York, do you know what happened to him? I don't know. Uh, York was one of the Academy horses. Uh, they had a, obviously quite a number of them. I don't know what ultimately happened to York. I hope he led a good life and had a pleasant retirement there at the point. That's another great story. And any of my students, if you're listening, uh, I hope they don't pick up on that top half of the bottom half. I hope they don't. <laughs> <know>. <laughs> let's not let's not go with that. 
Um, so it won't work. Your parents will not <laughs> accept it. Right, just like when they try to uh, to change the F to a B plus, that doesn't work either. You can tell the difference. No, <laughs> no and and tell them it, it won't work with their parents either because their parents aren't going to go for it. Right, read, study, read. So uh, you you grow up in Georgetown and you attend West Point, um, and you eventually you serve in the Mexican American War. You meet your wife. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are when you first go to the Dent household and you meet Julia. Fred Dent, her, uh, one of her brothers, she had, uh, she was one of eight children and she had four brothers. Uh, and Fred was one of the older brothers. Fred was my roommate for one of the years at the academy. And he told me that if you get assigned to Jefferson Barracks, that please go out and visit my parents. And he'd written his parents and talked about uh, Sam Grant. My nickname had become Sam Grant in the academy. He says Sam would uh, come calling. And uh, he did tell me, he said, I've got a sister, Julia, that uh, perhaps you'd meet. And uh, I went out there. I began, I got there in uh, August of 1843 in St. Louis. Jefferson Barracks is about eight miles from the Grant home of Whitehaven. And I went out there and paid my respects, met Colonel Dent and Mrs. Dent. Now, Colonel Dent's not really a colonel. He's a Southerner uh, owning a plantation. And all those Southern plantation owners call themselves Colonel. Uh, and it's something like Mr. I expect, and I called him Colonel. But I went about once a week. Uh, Julia was away at finishing school in St. Louis. And uh, she came home in January. So from August through January, I would call once a week and have a meal with them and got to know the folks and her uh, sisters and, and brother that was still there at the den home. Well, when Julia came back in late January, I met Julia and uh, then I began going every day. Uh, Julia had the smallest hands and feet of any woman I ever met. And she was also every bit the horsewoman that I was a horseman. She could ride as well as I, but she did it in a very long skirt riding side saddle. So we would ride and talk and visit. And I didn't realize it at the time that I was falling in love. After uh, a few months of that, getting into the spring of 1844 uh, now, uh, I was assigned somewhere else for a few weeks and was absolutely miserable the whole time I was gone. And I finally realized I'm in love. Well, when I got back to Jefferson Barracks, which is, by the way, still there as a museum now. So I urge you and all of your students, go visit Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I, I asked Julia to marry me and she promptly turned me down. <laughs> uh, and she, it was getting into the debutante season there in St. Louis and she didn't want to be engaged and be a debutante. So I asked her two or three more times and, and finally, well, and her father did not want me to marry her. He told me that I didn't raise my eldest daughter to live the life of an army wife, hard life in hard places on the frontier. Uh, no, sir, I will not approve this. Uh, but on a, a one particular evening, we were going to a, a wedding and we were crossing Gravoise Creek there, running past the property. It was swollen, flood waters and so forth. And I drove the buggy across the bridge and Julia reached over and clung to me. She said, oh, Mr. Grant, I should cling to you is for dear life and for life. And I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> I think you should marry me. So that's how I proposed. And she accepted. And I gave her my West Point class ring. I took it off my finger, slipped it on her finger. And she wore it from that day in 1844 until I slipped a wedding ring on her finger in 1848. Uh, so that's how I got engaged to my Julia Dent Grant. And, but not long after that, I should add quickly, we became involved in activities on the 
southern border, the Texas border, and I was sent to Galveston, Texas, as the uh, Nagadoche, Louisiana, as the Army of Observation. And then I was transferred to Galveston, and we were watching the Mexicans, and finally war breaks out, and we became an Army of the Invasion. And uh, I didn't see Julia from uh, until 1848. We wrote letters, and uh, a young man poured out his love to Julia. Uh, the, reading those letters uh, can be quite entertaining, and it gives you an insight into what was happening. I wrote about what we were doing in the Army and in the Mexican War. So uh, I didn't realize Julia was keeping all of those letters, but she did. And they're available for your students to read if you'd like. They make some really good reading because they're insightful into what I was thinking about the Army, the war, the Mexican armies. Because, see, I bitterly opposed the Mexican war. I think it was the uh, most unfair war ever fought by a stronger country against a weaker one. And, and I wrote that several times. And I have also written during the Civil War that I think this war is providential punishment for our having fought the Mexican War. Uh, in fact, I had said during the Mexican War, I, I really, I oppose it so much, I really ought to resign my commission and not fight, but I, I couldn't, I didn't know what else I would do for a living. So I stayed in the war and it benefited me for what I had to do in the Civil War. It was excellent training uh, in how to be a soldier, how to be an officer and a leader. But in 1848, war was over. I went back home to St. Louis and on August the 22nd of 1848, I married Julia Dent and she became Julia Dent Grant. Of note to you perhaps is that uh, two of the men who stood up with me were James Longstreet and Cadmus Wilcox. And they both became Confederate generals. Yeah, that's uh, a lot of ironies there, right? During your time at West Point, Simon Boulevard Buckner uh, and then Longstreet there. And, and um, some things we can talk about as well. Um, you mentioned writing to Julia during your time in the Mexican-American War. So I have to ask, uh, maybe this is something those listening, my students, you know, we sent our quick messages today, but when you're sitting there waiting to get a letter back from Julia and you're you're waiting for battle and uh, you're trying to control all these things, how do you keep your nerves in check? Are you worried Julia might not respond? Are you worried she might find a better suitor? I know Colonel Dent wasn't a big fan of yours, so. <laughs> Colonel, Colonel Dent did not want her to marry me. He, he told his wife, that boy's never going to amount to anything. Uh, I, I wrote her uh, constantly. But she wrote back to me, she replied one letter to every four or five of mine. Now, you should know that Julia has strabismus. Now, that may sound like a very expensive violin, but, but it is an ocular affliction. Her left eye is crossed almost to the bridge of her nose. So her right eye is, is well-formed and, and straight, but her left eye is crossed. So we, we all have binocular vision. With one of Julia's eyes crossed, writing and reading, which require your eyes to work together, writing and reading, uh, particularly writing, is uncomfortable for Julia. And she doesn't write much. In fact, in our later life, I'd like to add now while I'm thinking of it, I read to her a great deal because she loved to hear me read her the newspapers of the day. I read every newspaper I can get my hands on every day and the novels of the time. And Julia very much enjoyed and, and our children as they came enjoyed sitting in the parlor and my reading to Julia. So that's why she didn't write as many letters to me as I to her. But this alarmed me, as I, as I said, I was a young man in love, deeply in love. And it, it disturbed me. And I asked her on occasion, is there someone else? 
why do you not write me? Why do you not express your love for me? Is there is there someone else? Do I have a suitor competitor? And she always assured me, no, no, no. And and uh, that that didn't help a lot. Uh, so when I got home in 1848, the summer of 48, I told her, we're getting married, whether your father approves it or not. But Colonel Dent ultimately approved. And, and uh, on August the 22nd of 1848, in their town home in downtown St. Louis on Seary Street, C-E-R-E, -E, I think Seary was one of the, the Greek muses. But on Seary Street in their townhouse, August 22nd, 1848, we were married. Now, it was a, a pouring down rain all day. In fact, it was a frog drowner rain. And they had to keep the windows closed. It was like an oven inside that townhouse. All of us soldiers had our uniforms buttoned up. and The ladies were melting and wilting. Right before we married, rain stops, sun comes out. And it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful afternoon. Julia came down the staircase, a vision of loveliness, and we were married. And uh, I resumed my Army career. But I think it noteworthy, not only was James Longstreet a good friend of mine and one of my roommates at the Academy, he was also Julia's fourth cousin. So my wife is related distantly, but is related to James Longstreet, General Lee's old war horse. That's some interesting uh, connections there. Um, literally, brother versus brother, right? We have all these family connections in the war, and I think that's a good segue into the Civil War. So uh, war breaks out, and you take command of a volunteer regiment, whip them into shape, do some fighting, uh, and you eventually you capture Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, which is major victory for the Union when things aren't going very well. Uh, so did, did you feel like those victories kind of vindicated you? You're this man from small town Ohio, Colonel Dent doesn't approve of you, middle of your class at West Point, you had some failed business ventures there in, in, in between the wars. Uh, did you feel like that kind of vindicated you and you felt like you finally achieved what you were capable of? Yes, uh, Andy, to an extent, I, I did. Uh, I had been advocating to my superior officer, Henry Wager Halleck, in St. Louis, that I, I felt I had been advised by one of my generals on my staff that Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson could be taken. Now, Fort Henry, for your students, if, if you look at your map, Fort Henry is right at on the Tennessee River where it joins the Ohio River, or the Mississippi River rather. And so the taking of Fort Henry opened the Tennessee River all the way across the Southern uh, state line of Tennessee, all the way to Bridgeport, Alabama, which is right below Chattanooga. And uh, it was like a sword in the belly of the Confederacy because we could take iron class and go down between middle and central uh, West Tennessee, go down to Mississippi right at Shiloh where the Tennessee River curves north and take our Navy all the way across the state to East Tennessee and Chattanooga. Uh, it, and then we took Fort Donaldson uh, a few days later, we took Henry on the 6th, we took Donaldson on the 16th, 10 days later. When Fort Donaldson fell, it was on the Cumberland River. Now, the Cumberland River is a smaller river that runs into the Tennessee, but it also goes past Nashville, Tennessee, which uh, when we took Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee was a major railroad hub transportation hub. It had river traffic from the Tennessee, the Mississippi coming into the Cumberland River and going to Nashville, Tennessee. It had a major railroad hub, several railroads coming from the southeastern portion of the, of the United States, Louisiana, Florida, and, and the Carolinas, and they all funneled into Nashville. So when Nashville fell, 
not only was it the moral victory of a Confederate state capital has fallen, it was the first Confederate state capital to fall and was never recaptured by the Confederacy. But not only did we have the moral impact and weight of having taken a Confederate state capital, we also had a major distribution center by rail and river that we used to great advantage for the rest of the war. So the fall of Fort Henry or Fort Donelson on the Cumberland was like a dagger in the heart of the South. And it was it was the beginning of the end. Now, excuse me, did did I feel validated? In a sense, uh, Halleck didn't want to, to do that attack on those two forts on the river. He he didn't favor it. Uh, Captain Andrew Hull Foote of the United States Navy lent his way to the decision. And when he said we should do it, Halleck agreed. So I had the help of the Navy, both politically and convincing my superior officer to order the attempt to take Fort Henry and Donaldson. Uh, but I had the naval armament and strength of those gunboats. We had what they call a combined arms uh, campaign with the Navy supporting the Army. And uh, the Navy, I cannot praise enough, the Navy gave me hearty support at Shiloh and every time both prior and subsequent to my assuming command. The Navy did their job and they did it well, giving us great assistance. So I did feel vindicated. I thought, well, perhaps somebody is listening to me. When I took Fort Donaldson, I found myself the darling of the country. Uh, I was, my picture was on the front pages of newspapers across the country. Uh, I will tell you one thing that amused me. I, I was an unknown at that time. Nobody knew who General Grant, I was a brigadier general, one of hundreds, and nobody knew who I was until I took Fort Donaldson, the great victory at Fort Donaldson. Uh, the, one of the Chicago newspapers, I don't recall which one, had a full page, and that's front, top and bottom, a full page portrait engraving of the great Victor Grant, except it wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> It was a, a Chicago meat packer, a very portly fellow, big fellow, and bald. Uh, but he did have a beard, and they drew him in a uniform, engraved him in a uniform. And they said, the great Victor Grant takes Donaldson. So the first time that I'm pictured in a newspaper, it was somebody else. Uh, but I paid it no mind. I, I did feel validated, uh, and I, I thought... I felt that what I'm trying to do, the scheme, the strategy that I am trying to put into play in the war is one that will work, that we can prevail. And I marched on from Fort Donaldson. And well, and I have to ask, I know you said you've become the darling of the union. Uh, people start sending you boxes of cigars, right? So do you have a, a cigar that I'm a cigar smoker myself? So do you have a cigar you're particularly fond of? Is there? Well, I I, I didn't. I tried smoking in the academy and didn't like it. Uh, but in Mexico, I picked up the tobacco habit, and I like to smoke in Mexico El Sol cigars. I had a, a fondness for them, but I th the cigar tidal wave came from uh, one of the reporters there on the scene at Fort Donaldson uh, saw me at the end of the day on the 15th, uh, which we fought the great battle and, and saved the day. He saw me with a cigar that Admiral Foote had given me that morning when I met with him on his boat to talk about what he was going to do with the Navy. And it had long since gone out. But he, he said the great Victor Grant smokes a cigar and did an engraving of me with a cigar. Well, I got 12,000 boxes of cigars uh, in the days and weeks following that. And I was a pipe smoker. I preferred a pipe. But I had actually thousands of cigars. And I thought, well, I might as well smoke what I've got. 
so to answer your question, do I have a particular brand of which I am fond? No, I, I find myself smoking whatever cigar is at hand. I, I do feel like a cheap cigar uh, covers the the smell of cheap politicians, though. Uh, so cheap cigars have their place. I found that the higher that I rose in rank, the better quality cigars that came to my hand. Uh, but at Fort Donaldson, every man in the Army that smoked was smoking cigars because my staff was passing them out everywhere. We had... Uh, someone estimated we had 12,000 boxes of cigars. So they were about, there by the thousands. And that's where I picked up the, the, the tobacco, the cigar habit, but no particular brand. Well, if we jump ahead in the story a little bit, we can jump back. Uh, how do you feel when you become president or your presidential candidate? Uh, and they make a song about you, a smoke and a cigar. And, and, and now they're manufacturing Ulysses S. Grant cigars. Are you fond of that, not fond of it? What do you think? <laughs> I, I, I have a wry smile when I see Ulysses S. Grant cigars <laughs> uh, I, because I, I remember a day when no one knew who I was. And I, I, I'm not a, a self-promoter at all. So when I see those Ulysses S. Grant cigars, I blanch a little bit, but I do have to suppress a smile. Uh, in fact, I chose for our meeting today to wear my Lieutenant General uniform instead of my presidential suit, uh, because even uh, in, as president throughout my administration, people referred to me as general. Uh, I'm, I'm rarely ever called President Grant, so I thought it appropriate that I would wear my Lieutenant General's uniform. Uh, but it did make me smile. It did make me smile. It, it always does to see a Ulysses S. Grant cigar. I've had a few myself, so I can I can attest to them. But <laughs> so if we jump back to the to the war, you take Henry Donaldson. Uh, obviously, the Confederates still have a stronghold on the Mississippi, right? And you set your sights on that, uh, Vicksburg. So we talked about the story with The Rock and, and your childhood. You, you kind of develop this refusal to quit, right? This mentality as you're growing up. You, you try to take Vicksburg a few times. It, it doesn't succeed. Eventually, you get the gunboats passed. Sherman helps you out. You guys come up with a plan. You siege the city. On July 4th, 1863, they surrender. Do you think that there's a connection there between that boyhood uh, Hiram Ulysses Grants and this unconditional surrender grant that develops by the time we get uh, to the turning point of the Civil War? Yes, I do. Uh, in, in my attempts to be insightful and to know myself and to see what has been accomplished uh, through the, the, the help of the soldiers who fought that war, I did nothing. I merely had a plan and the privilege to lead those soldiers who did the fighting and the dying. I, I grew up in Georgetown and was, uh, had instilled within me uh, almost Puritan uh, ethics, strong work ethic, Everybody works, nobody shirks. And uh, I was reared with good manners and to be polite. I am naturally a quiet man. Now, notwithstanding how loquacious I have been with you today, but being with you today and doing what we are doing, I must needs talk a lot. You're hearing me talk more than, than people around me hear me talk in a month. I'm, I'm not a talker, but I wasn't a talker even as a child. People thought I was slow because I didn't talk much. But even as a tot, I felt if you don't have anything to say, don't say it. So I wasn't a talker. I have not been much of a talker all my life. I did, though, 
have now your listeners and watchers are all like me i am nobody special they're all like me they've all got innate talents they've all got qualities within themselves talents and qualities that given the opportunity to apply those talents and display those qualities such as hard work, the ability to do math, that, that's a, a, a talent. Uh, the hard work ethic that came with me, that was instilled in me and developed, applying what I, I'm born with, what I was, the environment in which I was reared, good guidance, good work ethic, that when I got into a command situation, a response, you know, remember, I went to college, I graduated from college. Uh, that doesn't ensure intelligence, and it, it doesn't guarantee success. Anybody can, can graduate from college if they work hard enough and long enough. A tradesman going to a trade school, that's an excellent thing to do. You don't have to have a college degree to be a success and to make a good living. So get it, but get a trade, get it, either get a skill, a trade, or get a, a degree that takes you into a professional realm. And for example, with myself, it was an engineer. So as I rose in command, I got the opportunity to have, to become Colonel of a regiment, and then I was appointed Brigadier General. The Army was exploding in 1861 with the enlistments. So the President Lincoln needed Brigadier Generals. Now, Brigadier General, that's French for brigade. Uh, and that's about, th about 4,000 men. And he needed middle management people. The Army was exploding at an average of 1,000 enlistments per day. And all these thousands of men who were civilians coming into the army needed guidance and leadership and training. And the army needed middle management men, brigadier generals, who could make things happen. So an opportunity through no doing of mine was put before me with an exploding army needing brigadier generals. My congressman knew me recommended me with my prior West Point experience and military experience in the war. And I was made a Brigadier General. Well, I've gone from Colonel to General, one star Brigadier General. And I was uh, in that rank until Fort Donaldson. Well, when I took Fort Donaldson, I got a second star. I'm, I was promoted to Major General. So opportunities because of the war and the need for leadership and the need for demonstrated success in that leadership, which I was evidencing, I was able to rise in rank. So what your listeners and viewers can, can take from this is you are who you are and you've got talents, you've got capabilities. Now those talents and capabilities if you don't develop them, you don't educate yourself in whatever you wish to do. If you don't train yourself and stretch yourself, those talents and abilities will be like giving a book to a man who can't read. If you can't read the book, you can't find out what's in it. If you don't develop your own innate talents, you can't be successful. Don't depend on luck. So I was able to have a good upbringing good work ethic. I keep stressing that, Andy. I was taught to work. Every, you work all the time. Be on time. Do the job the best you can until it's quitting time, then go home. Uh, so the work ethic is central to everything. Then you take the talents that you've got, and everybody's got talents. Everybody's got some things, more than one, that they are really good at that. Mine was being a leader. Mine was thinking things through and seeing where I wanted to go to picture a battlefield or picture a campaign of several battles and know 
to be able to see like in three dimensional chess where everything is supposed to be when it's supposed to be there. That was a talent that I had that I developed through experience and through study. So I had a combination. I'm evidence of a combination of a good upbringing, good work ethics, good sound principles of honesty and treating people with kindness. That golden rule comes into effect with me every day. Treat other people like you want to be treated. And you, in most cases, will not be disappointed. Sometimes you will. But most of the time, you will not be disappointed if you treat everyone as you yourself wish to be treated. And I practice that all my life. And it is that the work ethic and opportunities that I was able to take advantage of when they came my way with my training, my study, and my inborn bent to treat people with respect and kindness. All of those convoluted to push me up the ladder in the command of the Union Army. So it sounds like Georgetown, a small town on the Ohio River, has a big impact on who you become. Uh, you take Vicksburg, uh, major Confederate stronghold falls. Uh, you know, you win a series of battles. Eventually, you get promoted to command of the Union forces. Uh, you fight a series of costly battles. Uh, and you, you sort of develop this criticism against you in the press, especially in the South. Uh, high death tolls, Cold Harbor, the wilderness. Uh, we could take a look at these battles. What kind of toll does this take on you mentally, both the criticism and both these high uh, death tolls that uh, you're in command of these battles? It's uh, to articulate it, Andy, it was a heavy burden. It weighed heavily on my mind and the stress was great. The death tolls were high, but I should point out that I, I had a philosophy, a military strategic philosophy when I took command of the United States Army as the Lieutenant General. The high, there was only one Lieutenant General in the United States Army in the Civil War myself. I'm the first one since George Washington. And if your students wonder, well, how long has that been? Think about President Lincoln saying four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth upon this continent, our country was born. So it's been nearly 90 years since George Washington was made Lieutenant General commanding all of the, the Continental Armies. Uh, I, I wanted to get command of all of the armies and have them all move at the same time. The President Lincoln approved the uh, appointment and named me to be the Lieutenant General after I had assured him that I had no political ambitions. I see that's the backstory behind what's happening with me that I want your students and other viewers to be of which to be aware because President Lincoln was, he, he thought he was not going to win re-election. The war was not going well for the Union. The Confederacy was fighting well and lasting much longer than anyone thought they would. And a lot of the people in the North were, were, had already come to say, just let them go. Just leave them go and let's, let's have peace again. These death tolls are horrendous. President Lincoln didn't want to name me Lieutenant General, and in so doing, hand me the key to the front door of the White House and run against him. After I assured him that I had no political ambitions, I told him I'm a soldier and I have a job to do. Then he approved the named me to be the new Lieutenant General in command of all United States armies. Now, I was in command of five armies totaling more than a million men on March 10th, 1864. President Lincoln wanted me to do that because he knew that I would not turn away, that I would press the matter until we either won or lost. 
for the preceding three years from April of 1861 through March of 1864, the federal armies had gone across the Rapidan River or the Potomac River or whatever river they crossed, gone across the river, fought Lee Confederate Army, been whipped, gone back across the river into Washington, licked their wounds, paraded, strutted, rested, refitted, then back across the river and repeat the process. President Lincoln knew that I would not come back. I would press the matter. He knew too that the death toll was going to be high because as high as it was before I took command, no one had ever stood toe to toe with Robert E. Lee and slugged it out to the end. So when I went across that river on May the 4th and 5th of 1864, I took 120,000 men. Lee had 66,000. And uh, he hit me on the morning of May the 5th. We, we engaged in the Battle of the Wilderness. And that began the fight that lasted. Uh, the Wilderness was two days. Then I moved back to Spotsylvania Courthouse, Todd's Tavern in that area. And uh, we fought for the next 18 days altogether. Casualties were unbelievable. And then after uh, Spotsylvania Courthouse, I pressed south. I sidled around General Lee to the southeast and back uh, around him, behind him. And uh, he had to stretch his lines ever thinner. The casualties were indeed horrendous. The Overland Campaign lasted from May the 5th until June the 18th. The casualties, there were 12,000 men killed. Now this is on both sides. There were 12,000 dead on the fields. Another 88,000, 90,000 were wounded. Many of them died later in the weeks to follow. It was the bloodiest campaign in American history. And the weeping and wailing was heard across the land. The shadow of death had fallen across the land. And uh, I was called a butcher and a number of other hard things. But you see, I knew that we needed to press the matter and bring Lee to bay and defeat him. All of those three years prior to my taking command, the Federal Army goes across the river, they get whomped, they go back. A few months later, cross the river, they get whomped, and they go back. And repeat that process for three years. And I would have none of that. I knew the only way to defeat Robert E. Lee was to take him on nose to nose, toe to toe, and fight it out. The death toll was terrible, yes, and it was a heavy burden. But I will tell you this, the death toll was lower in those 40 days, as we call the Overland Campaign, May the 5th to June the 18th, 40 days in hell. The death toll, as high as it was, more than 100,000 casualties on both armies, was still not as high as it would be if we let this war drag on and on and on. There were two casualties due to death, uh, uh, illness. There were two men died of illness for every one man that died of combat related wounds. Now that's two men who died of measles, typhoid, pneumonia, smallpox, Two men died for every one man who died as a result of actual combat fighting. Now, I knew that men, more men were dying in the tents of smallpox, typhus, um, the measles, pneumonia, and other diseases in the tents, not on the, the field of battle. More men were dying in the tents because the war kept dragging on. 
that had to stop. So as high as the casualties were from my campaign, the Overland campaign, it was still lower than if I let the war drag on. We had a great number of deaths it compressed into a small period of time, which make them seem worse or higher than they were. Now, I don't play games with numbers, ne never play games with statistics and numbers. But because a man who is hit with a bullet or a shell fragment, it hurts just as bad whether he's one or one of 10. So play no games with numbers. Do not make light of wounded and dead on that field. But consider this, General Lee's casualties were consistently five to 7% higher than mine. Consistently five to 7% higher than mine. So who's the butcher? But again, I, I will go back. I'm not playing games with numbers. A man who's, who's hurt, he's hurt. It's a hundred percent for him. Mm -hmm. So, but keep in mind, am I a butcher? No, I knew and I still maintain that the numbers that we suffered in the Overland campaign of, of wounded and dead were less if we'd let the war drag on. It had to be brought to a conclusion. So I, I take the criticism, it stings to be called a butcher. Even Mrs. Lincoln called me a butcher. It stings. I don't like those long casualty lists, but how much longer would they be if I continued what the federal command had been doing for three years, I would be guilty of nothing less than murder if I let that continue. So I, I told President Lincoln in that famous line in, in the Battle of the Wilderness, I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. And I meant it. I didn't intend for it to be a battle cry that echoed across the land. I did not write it for posterity. I wanted President Lincoln to know I'm not coming back. Tell him, I said in that message, everybody knows that I wrote, I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. You all know that. What you haven't heard is, I there, tell the president, I told the, the journalist that took that message. I said, tell the president for me, there will be no turning back. So I sent him that message. I'm going to be here all summer if it takes it, but also assure him I'm not turning back despite the heavy casualties. And I submit to you that that is exactly what ultimately brought the war to an end in the next 11 months. Yeah, that's a great mindset and a great take on uh, something a lot of people try to criticize you for. And, and I think President Lincoln's fears were a little uh, founded there and the fact that McClellan tried to run against him in 64. So I can understand why he'd want to make sure you didn't have any political ambitions. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Civil War Center podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave a review. We'd love to hear from you. Also, head to the thecivilwarcenter.com to learn more.